Well, welcome everyone to the 27th Degree, brought to you by 27 Degrees Consulting with Chris and Nancy. And today we're very excited to have Barbara Roderick here. Barbara is a primary mental health nurse practitioner. And today we're going to talk a little bit about opioid addiction. So Barbara, why don't you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself and your background and what you do. Hello. Um, I've been a um, nurse for over 20 years. And um, currently, I'm an attending on a dual diagnosis um, unit. Um, I have a lot of experience in the detox world with opioid and mental health. Tell our listeners a little bit about what dual diagnosis means. So dual diagnosis is a person that has mental health issues, anxiety, depression, um, bipolar, and also has a substance abuse component um, where they are, you know, they're struggling with both. So when we look at the opioid problem and what we're facing right now, can you, like, compare it to five years ago or ten years ago even, and, and kind of what you've seen and what you've seen it evolve into? Well, I worked in a detox unit even ten years ago, and, um, you know, heroin, heroin was the big uh, drug that was out there at that time. And then as we've proceeded, um, and now we have the fentanyl, um, in my opinion, it's gotten a lot worse, a lot worse and dangerous. Um, so now we've just gone through all this COVID mess. What have you seen during the COVID mess? And is it getting a little bit better? How has it affected like community resources? Um, yes, it has impacted greatly, um, in my opinion, um, you know, the human communication of, you know, patients going into the doctor's office and being able to walk into places, um, has, you know, has been a struggle for a lot of people, um, lack of supports, the isolation, um, it's been very difficult for, you know, a lot of our folks. Is it is it getting better out there? Like, uh, are like the you know AA groups had shut down for a while. The NA groups had shut down for a while. Are they reopening? Like, if you're struggling with an addiction right now in your home, and you're happen to be listening to our podcast right now, thinking I'm just like I I really messed up. I don't know what to do at this point. Who can who can someone struggling with addiction right now reach out to? What's out there in the community? that may like have opened up recently, you know, that wasn't available before? I'm not sure in a lot of communities, but down in this area, a lot of the AAs <clears throat> and the NA meetings are still being done, you know, via, um, you know, Zoom, FaceTime, I think, like stuff like that. So I haven't really heard that it's improved greatly. Mm. Um, by my patients, um, it's just the isolation that's really oh, sure. has them struggling. And you know, a lot of patients, depending on the socioeconomic status, they don't have phones. Like some people don't even have phones. Right. Mm. So um, that's you know been hard. And of course, the homeless population, um, shelters have you know uh, reduced capacity. So, yeah, you know, that's, true. Um, that's a good point. I mean, um, you know, it, all of this technology is great. You know, you can do Zoom meetings and all that if you have access to the technology. But uh, probably there are a lot out there who are really struggling financially, economically, who don't have phones, computers, access to use those resources. So they're essentially cut off from the support that they had previously. And with COVID, you know, uh, folks that have elderly parents and people, you know, that were uh, rightfully so, are freaked out over this COVID, did not want their family members coming to stay with them right. um, because of the, you know, the, um, the jeopardy of, of sure. getting COVID. Sure. So it's just been really difficult. So Barbara, one thing I've noticed in my practice as a physician is that there's just, as far as mental health issues go with COVID, everything has really um, accelerated. So patients who were you know, mildly anxious or mildly depressed before now come into the office really with more severe symptoms. I see much more of that in my office. So I, I, I can imagine that with patients who have severe mental illness and addiction issues, that has to be uh, worse. I mean, there has to be that stress that they're experiencing has to make all of that more complicated. It's god awful. Yes, it is. They just, 
they just, you know, a lot of them don't have the coping. They don't have the resources. They don't, right. you know, I, you know, I, um, you know, I feel for them. And it's hard to, you know, even where I work, trying to get them in back into the community once I, you know, um, discharge them. A lot of the, um, the step-down levels of care, um, which means that, you know, they come in patient and they, they step down to, say, a lower level dual diagnosis, then there's, um, there's uh, we call it CSS, it's a community support um, level, and then we have TSS, which is transitional. And because of COVID, they've also decreased their capacity and can't take in as many patients. So, um, you know, that's been an impact too. So a lot of times patients get frustrated and they just want to go. And, you know, trying to set them up with providers out there um, is is hard. And, you know, mm. the outcome is not going to be good. Sure. They're either going to come back, um, hopefully, um, or, you know, Sometimes they can go to families, but I haven't seen that for the most part. So is that typical, Chris? Like you had talked about in your practice, you have someone that has a, uh, one of the providers has a, a background with addiction or um, addiction specialty. Right. Is that Do most practices try to do that? I think it's variable. I mean, we have, you know, we have a, a number of providers in our practice, so we're able to do it, you know, I think. I think it's variable. I, I can't really speak for other practices, but you know we have um, we've recognized that there's clearly a need out there. Um, there's been a need for a long, long time. I mean, this what's been going on with our society in relation to opioids has really changed over the last you know number of years that I've been a practitioner. So, you know, I've been in practice um, you know since '97. Before that, I was in residency in medical school, but I've had experience, you know, seeing patients with opioid addiction since I was, you know, in medical school quite a few years back. So, you know, over 20 years, 25 or more. Um, it's just really interesting how things have changed. And I mean, as Barbara mentioned, um, I, I don't know that things are honestly getting better. I think, if anything, uh, we see more and more uh, issues as time goes on. I think back to 20 years ago, this was my experience, yours may be different, Barbara, but you know, we, I was in Worcester at the time, or a little over 20 years ago. We had a lot of, of heroin uh, usage that occurred, but we didn't, certainly didn't have, there was no fentanyl and, and drugs such as that. And certainly heroin's a horrible drug, I'm not diminishing that, but no. what we're seeing now with fentanyl is, oh. I, I see um, a, a lot of really unintentional overdoses that I don't think that people realize just how potent this drug necessarily is. And certainly heroin itself, we see a lot of overdoses with too. But fentanyl has just really changed everything a lot. Um, it's interesting to think about how our culture has, has, this is my opinion only, but has changed, you know, from a physician's perspective. I'll tell you how things kind of went along. So, you know, a number of years ago, you know, we would prescribe pain meds here and there for patients, but it wasn't really that common that we would do it. We weren't doing it, you know, um, as easily as maybe it was, let's say, 20 years ago versus 10 years ago. And then I think things really changed, you know, when OxyContin came out because the drug company really, um, there was a lot that went on pushing OxyContin as a safe drug, and the drug company would talk about the fifth vital sign and pain as the fifth vital sign, and they tell doctors these scary stories about, you know, physicians who had been, you know, sued or lost their li licenses because they didn't uh, treat pain effectively. So I think, you know, from a physician's perspective, a lot of us, you know, started to treat more uh, pain uh, with, with opioids. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons that there's so much opioid use out there, but certainly from our perspective, a lot occurred mm -hmm. where we, we used it. And then we realized after a while that, um, you know, this was being abused and this was really something that was needed to, we needed to get under control. And I think a lot of physicians have done that, you know, in their offices and they have you know, policies and procedures in place with, um, you know, drug contracts where if you're on a pain medication, you get drug tested, you sign a contract that states basically what the um, expectations are if you're on that medication. 
But it's, it's really interesting how society, has, to me, over 20 years has changed. You know, as a physician, I think it went from probably not being prescribed a lot to being overprescribed. And now we're kind of going back down, but we're still left with this massive problem that's out there in the community. Um, so it's Agreed. interesting that you brought up the pain medication piece because sure. I think we all know everyone in our family, there's someone who will break sure. their ankle and be like in pain all the time because, oh, they're not going to take anything. Sure. They, they don't want to run into any problems. Yep. What do you say to patients that are like, um, I'm really not going to take this? I can't. I... Uh, if they don't want to take it, that's absolutely fine because, you know, you can take a medication for three days and become addicted. I mean, it does not take a long time to become addicted to these meds. So, I mean, I actually recommend that patients are very careful about the use of these meds. Um, and then there are certain conditions. So when you, can we just back up yeah, a little sure. bit too? Like when you say the use of these meds, like what yeah. kind of meds are you talking any, about? Any, any narcotic basically. So Percocet, Vicodin, um, you know, morphine, although of course someone's not going to start right off the bat on morphine. It's usually going to be, I don't know, Tramadol, Vicodin, Percocet would be oxycodone. the Oxycodone. Yeah, yeah. Or oxycodone, which is Percocet. So those types of things would be what we'd be talking about. Apparently, like when you have a, a patient, um, are there any red flags to you that say, this isn't someone I really want to go down this yeah, path? Yeah, I mean, I think Barbara can, will probably be, yeah, you know, speak sure. to this too. But for me as a physician, family history of addiction is really important. Personal or f personal history of addiction, you know, of course, is important. If they have a history of, um, alcoholism, I become concerned about giving them opioids. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, you know, and then mental illness is, of course, an issue. Poor coping skills. All of these things can lead to, to problems. But sometimes, frankly, you really can't predict it. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the scary part to it. You know, every once in a while, you get a call from a family member who says, you know, Joe Smith is in trouble, and you have no idea that they were even using this stuff. They, they've been to see you for their physicals. They seem healthy. They haven't brought up issues. But they've been, you know, getting fentanyl off the street or Percocet or oxycodone or whatever it may be. So um, there's a lot of red flags, but there's a lot of people that you would never really... No one falls... Not everyone falls into a category, you know? Right. I think we all have our... People have these... Um, perceptions of what uh, an addicted person is like, and that's often not the case. Okay. It covers all socioeconomic categories. It covers all person types. And you can probably speak more to this, Barbara, but it's there's no one category or one type of person or one red flag, but there are red flags that are out there that you can use. So when you're dealing with families, like... Do you, first of all, with the program that you have, I want to back up just a little bit because sure. you kind of touched upon the different programs that you have. Mm -hmm. um, so what can, if I'm struggling with an addiction and I know I need help, how do I even get into an inpatient rehab? Like, I mean, what are the steps? Do I just call up and say, hey, I need some help. Mm -hmm. Let me in. So, you know, what we want, what you want to see with a family member or a patient or anything, their desire to want to change, right? So um, if it's just strict detox, um, they can call these detox places and they can, you know, do intakes and um, they can get in voluntarily through them. Um, <clears throat> but then when it gets a little bit more where some of these patients are hopeless, helpless, and they're suicidal, they're, you know, they're in imminent risk to hurt themselves, um, then it's always, um, it is always recommended and needed to go to their local near, nearby um, emergency department. Right. And then once they go to the emergency department, they'll be uh, medically cleared um, that um, they'll be seen by a physician or a provider, PA or NP. Um, they usually do a talk screen. They'll do a blood alcohol level and, you know, find out really what, what's going on. And then they'll be seen by a um, mental health clinician. Um, and then they will deem, as the team, the provider and the, um, the, um, the provider and the um, crisis team what would be the best, uh, you know, plan for this patient. Um, and if we deem them an imminent risk, then... Um, they will go to an inpatient level of care, which could be, you know, um, a dual diagnosis unit per se or psych. And then once they get there, 
you know, we detox them, we get them in a better place, and then we talk about the plan, and that's when we can do the step downs, mm -hmm. like I said, like to a lower level dual, then you have the CSS, the TSS, they can go to sober living, um, you know, and they can get a pretty decent amount of time out of it. Yeah. Um, but there's some barriers there, you know, I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they're on a unit with, you know, 20 plus patients, there's a lot of personalities, and the one mm -hmm. thing that you know, and I'm a healthcare provider, but it's just the smoking. If they could just smoke, <laughs> they would stay. And I wish that we could do that, but the Department of Public Health and whatnot, and that's another podcast. Mm. Um, but, you know, that's one of the barriers. Um, and, you know, they're, they're locked up for, you know, they, yeah. you know, they go outside and they have groups and they do all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the idle mind is not... Um, is not great when we're mm -hmm. when a lot of people are sitting with themselves, and there's a lot going on. So right. now the programs that you offer, like the inpatient program, <clears throat> typically they're they're getting a lot of um, therapies, coping skills. Um, they're being watched medically. Yeah, walk us through what what would one experience if they were in an inpatient program? Can you tell us a little bit about that? So, you know, when you say inpatient, it's voluntary versus, versus involuntary, right? Okay. So when you're involuntary, you can't leave until the provider decides that you're safe to go. Okay. So that, that level of care, um, you know, they come in, um, you know, they come on the unit, they're seen by a, um, a provider um, to do the admission, and then we, you know, we look at... we do the assessment of, you know, what uh, drugs they're using, what we need to do to safely detox them. And then also I talk about their mental health issues and, you know, decide to put them on depression, bipolar meds, um, whatever the symptoms are. <clears throat> and then the average length of stay there is uh, around eight days. Yeah. Um, but the unfortunate part is, um, you know, they're, they have the legal right to sign what we call a three, a notification of desire to discharge in three days. So um, that kind of sometimes um, throws a little wrench, throws in a wrench into it because I can't do much in three days. Right. Um, but at the, uh, on the third day, um, three things happen. Um, I let them go. I ask them to rescind that three day um, and give me more time. Um, if I really feel hard pressed that you know, I can't let them go and they won't rescind, then I will file with the court to do a commitment. Um, on the level of care that I, that I work with, most of the, some of the times they'll, they'll rescind and stay an extra couple of days. Um, and then they go to groups. Um, there is no therapy per se. It's all group kind of stuff. They do see a case manager, right, you know, soon after they get there to, to start working on the plan. Um, they see me every day, and on the weekends they're seen by a provider. So, you know, we, we, try, to, we try to get them, you know, in a better place before we discharge them. But the struggle is with a lack of beds and the lack of resources sometimes, you know, they get discharged to a homeless shelter or they go to a friend's house, and you know, I know in my heart of heart that that plan isn't the yeah. greatest, but... So we see a huge recidivism rate with this. Like oh, yes. People, it's yes. not just go to rehab and you're cured forever. Right. So you see a lot of repeaters and people that just struggle with this for a long period of time. Yeah. And my last, my, my words to them all the time is, you know, if you don't, safe when you, if you don't feel safe when you get out there, you right. go back to that emergency department because, you know, and come back, you know, because when you say recidivism, it's, you know, they're, they're like a family, right? Like mm. I see them, they come back, and they'll be like, oh, Barbara, I'm back again. I'm like, I'm glad you're back, right? Mm. We, we're going to do this again. We've got to do it mm. again till we get it right. So, do you, Is there anything that you see, um, like programs or treatment options, that really does resonate with a lot of the patients that you see? Is there, like I know, of course, there's not that one magic bullet, right? No. But is there anything that, you know, has, you've seen some some type of success with more than others maybe um or everyone is so individual it's, it's just, just not it's a one just... size fits all with this with this um you know i mean i have patients that have i hadn't seen in a long time they've come back and i'll say to them hey how did you 
you know, what happened? Like you would, yeah, I was doing well for a year and, you know, maybe it was a death, it was a breakup. Um, some don't know, um, you know. It is, always, is it always the big triggers? Like, of course, that's difficult to go through. Like COVID's been difficult to go through. Yeah. That can be a trigger to, to restart or, or kind of fall down a little bit, you know, deaths and breakups and what have you. Um, anything that people should kind of definitely stay away from? We've heard that people struggling with addiction, maybe they need to change a friend base, which is very hard to do, but kind of remove yourself from situations. So I have somebody very close to me that struggles with, um, with addiction. And um, she had a really tough bout for many years. And that was the one thing that she, um, we had to get her out of the environment. So yeah. she did end up going to, um, to Boston, believe it or not, and was in this halfway house that I just wish we had a ton of them mm -hmm. because she went there. Uh, it was a lot of girls in there. Um, but she worked and in Boston, she could, you know, she could mm -hmm. take the train. Um, and they, uh, and when she worked, they took X amount of money from her and they saved it. Like she had to, she had to get, um, money orders. Um, they had chores, they had, um, you know, there was a purpose, you know, and, right. and, you know, and the job didn't have to, it could be whatever. And it was just, you know, I just feel like people need a purpose. That's important. And yeah. it's so yeah. important. Good and point. they just, you can't just, you know, go to a program and just sit and just dwell about the things that have gone on in your life. The big thing that is just horrific and has ruined these pe people's lives is trauma. I mean, trauma is sure. really, really god awful. And it's, people can get through it. But it's just they need those supports. They need, mm -hmm. and they need a purpose. You know, whether it's volunteering, and and that you know, a lot of the insurance companies have um, CSP workers, com community support person. And when you get that person that you really click with, you know, they can really be, you know, a good resource for these patients to, yeah. you know. I think the patients I've had who've been successful, they have to, first of all, they have to acknowledge that there's an issue. Correct. Of course. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that's sometimes difficult. Um, secondly, they have to have the, the support in place. And part of that has been, you know, not just the program support, but as you mentioned, Nancy, kind of getting away from situations where um, they're going to be, uh, they're just going to be in the kind of the same old way of dealing with their Enemy stress and, yeah. and yeah it's it's some 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 of my patients have had to actually change their entire lifestyle and friend base and just like you say almost move away because it's just very difficult to get through this without that well how do you think as a society we got to the point we're at I mean I think about that a lot what do you think I mean do you have any any sense because this wasn't I don't think the issue it is now you know certainly 30 years ago um, so how did we get here? What did we do as a society? It's a big question to get us to where we are right now. With the opioid? Yeah. I mean, I think the pain, you know, the, the prescribing, the prescribing of pain was medication clearly, was huge. That was a big part of it, no doubt. Um, you know, that was one, um, but that, that I think is, it, I think that's slowing down and we don't see this issue slowing down. So there's more to, to this problem. Well, so then you, you also want to think about like pain, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of my patients, you know, they're young and, you know, um, it didn't start out with pain, mm -hmm. right? It was self-medicating for that underlying mental health issue, sure. which we start with, of course, the kids start smoking marijuana, right? So, right. You know, they don't, you know, whether it was trauma, abuse, you know, whatever it was, or just not feeling okay. Right. So you it's know? not just physical pain, it's mental, right, emotional, right. spiritual Fish. suffering, mm -hmm. existential suffering, all of that. Right. So then, you know, they're in school, they're, you know, they start with the marijuana and then, you know, there's pills out there and, you know, they all oh, trust, try this drinking. Um, so I just think that. I think that's a huge question too. I mean, I think we're just such a fast paced society yeah. and we don't have that nucleus, you know, a, a lot of instances where come on and sit down for dinner, Bobby Sue and Jimmy Joe, we're yeah. all going to like talk for an hour and eat our, our dinner every night at five o'clock. I, you know, I, yeah. I think that the family structure has changed. We're fast paced. Everyone's looking for that, you know, quick moment to feel good. It's 
hard when you ask a question like that. There's so much that goes into it. And the cost. I mean, they, they, these are not costly drugs. But what comes to my mind is, you know, when I was growing up, you know, um, sports wasn't this big thing, right? Like, right. I mean, yeah, boys played sports, girls played minimal sports. And now, even when I had my children, I mean, we were at the soccer field. We were we were everywhere. Yeah. And I think the the expectations and the stress mm -hmm. on society, yeah, in my opinion, point. is way worse yeah. now yeah. because yeah. they got to go to college, they got to play sports, they got to be the they got to be the A student, they got to be the best of the best. <clears throat> and I used to see parents like, you know, on the at the fields, just really like almost playing the sport through their child, yes. yelling yes. at them. And yes, we've all seen. Sometimes that. I get a little out of control. You know? Yeah, no doubt. So, social media has been. I think oh, yeah. the ruination, you know, I mean, you know, when I went so to school, stress. you had that telephone in the house, like, you know, you, you closed down when you left school, like if mm -hmm. something was going on, like with all this bullying and all this stuff, even with adults, I mean, they're getting right. you on the, you know, texting you, they're, they don't, we don't call anybody anymore, right? So texting, um, Facebook, Instagram, Instagram, and it's really, it's really, there's definitely a lot of internet bullying that goes on, you know. And I, a very I, high I, impact. We, we do see that. It yeah. has a terrible effect on kids, there's no doubt. That's a whole other probably talk. Yeah, yeah. another do, podcast. But, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, but exactly. I mean, I think <coughs> but all of this <coughs> stuff. So, you know, there's there's the stress that, that people feel in society now. There's breakdown of relationships. And not just family structure, but I think relationships are often very different now than they were years ago. Um, and, and, and you're, like you said, the availability of the, the drugs too, uh, that's a big issue also. So, so a lot going on, but then how do we fix it? You well, know? first of all, how do you notice it? Like as a parent, how do you know if your kid's in trouble? What are you seeing? I think it's behavior, you know, you yeah. know your kid, you know, I mean, he's, a, you know, you, you know, it's more, you know, the isolative stuff, the, um, you know, um, the, the communication with your child, who they're hanging out with, you know, not wanting to be involved. That's kind of, it's, it's, it's depending. <laughs> it can be tough. I mean, God, when I remember when, when my son was going through high school, I mean, we, we, we communicated, he communicated like a caveman. It was just grunts. It was like, uh, 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 are you yeah. doing, a, you know, there was no like big long conversations or anything. Yeah. So physical signs, like what, what do you guys see for like physical signs of addiction? Sleeping all the time, you know, maybe going out late at night, um, you know. Yeah. You know, of yeah. course, vomiting, you know. I mean, it's, you know, the withdrawal symptoms. Um, of, like I said, vomiting, uh, irritability, Yeah. you know. Um, but again, I will say this with, you know, I've talked to many parents and, you know, some will say, I didn't see it, and uh, you know, and then... Life is so fast paced, yeah. you know, are we really paying attention? Because you're right, we're not sitting at, at dinner, having dinner every night with the family. We're not, we're not doing, we, we don't just, the family time is just really fractured, I think, yeah. in this society, because we just, we're, we're going 100 miles an hour. So, you know, it's not unheard of for parents to have not seen it. Right. I, I mean, something simple like that just sitting with your kids at dinner time every night and making a commitment to that could probably make a big difference for a lot of people because you're going to have that that conversation and you know develop a deeper relationship and whatnot so it's and hard put the phones away yeah i know That's i remember such a big you know thing. the phones yeah when my kids were doing sports i used to get really outraged that they would have these games on father's day mother's day all it's really we've gone crazy with we our have. society with we this have. stuff and you know, I'm I'm glad that they're past that point now. But it, it was, it was maddening that they would take these family times for a game, basically. And I'm sure there's others out there who will completely disagree with me, <laughs> but I thought that it was it was wrong, frankly, because it took away from that relationship, and that interaction that you would have as a family. Kind of sticking to the the family theme for a, a few minutes. What? So if I notice, like I really am pretty sure my son, for instance, has a, a drug problem. What can I do as a parent? You know, so they're 16, 17 or younger or older. You know, what, how do, 
how do I, like my first thing is I want to fix this. I just want to get you healthy again. Like, how do I do that? How do I be part of that solution with someone that may or may not think they have a problem or don't want me to mess around with them? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, you know, you got to do the search of the rooms. You got to, you know, play detective. I mean, as a mother, most of us do that. Um, and then, you know, so and I conf- find something like, what do I do? You can, well, I mean, you confront them and, or she, you know, you confront them and, you know, and just, of course, you know, they'll minimize it. And, um, I was just going to ask you like, what does that conversation look like? Yeah, it's probably not going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be good. Um, they'll minimize it. Of course, everybody's smoking marijuana, mom, you know, everybody's right. doing that, you well, know? Well, so that's, that's the next question I was going to ask you that that's what comes up, you know, Literally, in, with my patients, my younger patients, I would say like 70% of them smoke pot. Um, you know, that's the ones that admit they do. So um, what about that? I mean, does that lead to other things? Is that a problem in our society? It's been so normalized now, which I right. have an issue with. Mm, right. um, tell me about your thoughts on that. <laughs> so, you and know. I was just thinking that's probably another podcast. Too, yeah. Right. But, yeah, but, in a nutshell. Bob. But my patients, you know. You know, when I did outpatient, you know, they'd be like, oh, Barbara, you know, I smoke marijuana. I'm like, I know you do. Um, but um, I personally um, think it is mind altering. End of story. I mean, it's so is an alcohol because um, they, they challenge me all the time. Um, you know, it helps with sleep. It helps with anxiety. But I have found that, you know, when you're dependent on it and it's every day, it can actually cause anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um You know, at this point in my career, um, you know, I just, you know, with the the dispensaries, um, you know, we know that they're that's being regulated versus the stuff they're buying on the street. I have patients all the time will come in and which I don't understand. Well, you know, there'll be like fentanyl in there or there'll be cocaine cocaine in there. And they're like and they'll be like, uh, I swear to God, I do not do cocaine. That had to be in the in the marijuana. And I don't know. Maybe they're telling the truth. I don't know. I mean. You know, I, I I think a lot of it is probably tainted, quite honestly. Absolutely, absolutely. So that that's a bigger question, right? So, you know, I can't really say, oh yeah, you know, if you want to smoke blunts, you're okay. I'd be, you know, it would be safer to do it with the with the dis, at the dispensary because you know that, as far as I know, this yeah. that's not being tainted. But I do think it is a gateway because, you know, again, when you when you're drinking or you're doing smoking marijuana and it's a recreational socially once in a while well okay we all do right well no we don't all but you know okay that's one conversation but then when it becomes like every day Mm -hmm. seven days a week then it's you know and it just never stops and when i worked at a detox many years ago you know it all no everybody was smoking marijuana but then it just proceeded because they're self-medicating so i guess it just depends on being honest with yourself to say, is this just recreational once in a while or am I self-medicating? And most of my patients. And I guess, you know, a, a, a good litmus test for that is, can I stop if I want to? And if you can't easily stop, then, you know, it... it or want to stop. Right. Right. You know, it, it kind of turns into more of a problem. So get, just getting back to the family. So now I know, like, my son or daughter has a drug problem. Who can I talk to? Where can I go with this? Are there groups out there? You know, whether they're they're been impacted right now for COVID, but are there traditional groups out there that offer support? Like, you know, Al Anon. I think many people are familiar <coughs> with like a, an Al Anon type group. Is there a group like that for? There is Al Anon, and I know that some of the hospitals have um, substance abuse support groups. Um, I don't know about now, but, um, yeah. they have the other thing too is, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not on social media, but Facebook I'm sure has yeah, groups that you can be, you know, um, invited to, um, to, for support. Um, so with all the overdoses that we're seeing, um, let's talk a little bit about Narcan. So the past couple of years, I mean, you guys know better, mm-hmm. um, it's become a more widely available yeah. for yeah. people. Yeah. Sure. So can we kind of talk a little bit about that and how you would use that and what circumstances you would use that in if you're yeah. like a, a parent or a friend or... Well, I think, first of all, just as a pres- 
as far as prescribing goes, anyone who's on a, a chronic pain medication in my office is has a script for Narcan. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Because there are a lot of unintentional overdoses that can occur. So, and, and also a, a real complex issue is this whole problem we have now with opioids and benzodiazepines too because the overdose rate is much higher and it's oh it's unintentional people take two sedating meds and then the effect like is an example amplified. would be someone who's on for example xanax or clonopin they may be on it for their anxiety maybe they have a panic disorder and they're on clonazepam and then they get a pain medication for some other issue so now they're on oxycodone and they're on say Xanax or clonazepam, sure. there, there can be unintentional overdoses that occur. So, you know, if someone's on chronic pain meds in my practice, I give them a script for Narcan. Um, I, I think that makes perfect sense. Now, out in the community, if someone is using drugs, they should also have Narcan available. A family member should have Narcan available, or they should have Narcan available because, um, you know, it's life-saving, quite honestly. So... So, so just F FYI, you can anybody can go into the pharmacy, mm -hmm. um, and ask that yes, yeah. anybody can go into the pharmacy as long as it's for you, and you have insurance. Unfortunately, um, you can um, you can get a um, script. I mean, you can you they'll put it through your insurance company, and you can get Narcan um, for a family member. Um, yeah, for family members, um, there's a there was a lot of you know community health clinics that you could go yeah. in. You could go to classes, right. um, and they teach you how to use the Narcan. Um, and it's not hard to use. No, right? no, now it's even easier. <clears throat> they, it was it, a couple of years ago. It, it was kind of yeah, but because you had to put it together. Now they have the it's nasal. Very it's very yeah. simple now. So, so can you just quickly describe that? What does it look like, and how do you use it? It's just like a like a nasal spray, right? Like a nasal, yeah, yeah. yeah. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. And there's instructions, but it's, it's, it's they've come a long simple. way. Super simple now, and it should act really quickly. But I will say this, um, like you just said, as yeah. far as the benzodiazepines, yeah. you know, a lot of times, you know, if there's opiates in the receptors and you you um, you administer the Narcan, it's going to work. But if you keep administering yeah. Narcan and it doesn't yeah. work, then it's then there's something else. It's something else going and on. And you have to get, you have to, you know, call nine one one immediately. The stuff yes. Wears off. Yes. And then if they're on something that's really potent, let's say fentanyl or something of that nature, that's longer acting too, um, you know, it, they're going to become sedated again. So it's going to wear off after a period of time. Right. So that's an issue. So you have to call nine one one. Um. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so they can get, um, go to the pharmacy. So we have talked a little bit about how people get into these programs and what families can mm -hmm. do. What mm -hmm. are, what are other avenues? Like I, you hear stuff like a section 35. What's mm -hmm. a section 35? Right. So and a, how is that used? Right. So a section 35 is um, a physician can do it, a nurse practitioner can do it, a police o uh, a police officer can do it, um, but also families, families can, can do it, can petition the section 35. And yep. what that is is you go to the court and you you know you tell them you want to um, petition a section 35, and they'll have you fill out paperwork. And the, your um, child or family member has to be um, an imminent risk right now, for example. And you will have had to have seen the drug use, maybe stealing, um, car accidents, uh, prostitution, um, you know, really um, risky, risky behavior because of the substance abuse. So you go to the court, and then um, they will... Um, You'll talk to the, the clinician at the court and then the judge, and then if they find that it's warranted, they'll um, issue a warrant of apprehension. You, you have to know where the person is. They'll go pick them up, they'll bring them to court, and they, um, they get a lawyer, and you know they, um, they have to try to plead their case, and you're pleading your case. And, and if it goes through, then they will be admitted for up to 90 days. It used to be up to 30, and the the state of Massachusetts um, uh, changed it to up to 90 days. So um, they will be um, admitted, 
and um, it is a good program. Um, there's one in Taunton for the females. Um, down in New Bedford, there's the Women's Addic Addiction Treatment Center in New Bedford. And the males, I think, go to Plymouth. But the courts can tell you, you know, the places, and they will place them there. And um, All right, so let me back up and just walk through this a little sure. bit. So Johnny comes home. He had a wild night last night. I was super worried about him. This is like the 10th time he's done this. And I just have, like, something bad is one night he's not going to come home. So I just walk into the courts. And well, I don't well, know what you do well, now. No, all... Well, not well with COVID, but, but I, I, like, will just, I will just say, I, I, will just, I will just say this. I mean, you know, have an exper personal experience myself. Um, confront the family member and the child, and you know what's going on, and really try to get them into a detox. Yeah. And really, you know, try to, you know, see them through this. It'd be better if it were voluntary. In other words. Right, right, exactly. Um, I don't, yeah. I mean, you want to try to do the best that you can to get them the help that they need on a voluntary basis right. um, and give them some a chance. Um, if they don't, or they've been to, to detox several times and we just can't seem to get it because, again, you know, the, the length of stays are so small that, you yeah. know, that's yeah. kind of, you know. This, this, is this, this is a, there's a longer length of stay with this. It's up to 90 yeah, days, so. and the average length of stay, I know when I, I did work at Women's Addiction Treatment Center, it was at least 21 to 24 days. Yeah. Um, so it's it's it gives them a sure. a good time to hopefully sit and say, like, listen, at once they get detoxed and they start feeling better. Um, is there not a pocket cost for this? Like no, it's I, insurance. So insurance and will cover like insurance 100%. pays, and then DPH, um, the Department of Public Health, has funds that okay. that pay for this. Yeah, no. Barbara, let me ask you this question because there's a lot of skepticism out there when you hear stories. You know, well, you know, this person has gone through a, a program five, six, seven times. They're never going to get better. I mean, do you see people who go through programs ten, fifteen times and then they're fine? They're well, not fine, but they are able to beat it. I mean, tell me about that. What success stories have you seen? You know. Yeah, I mean, I've seen. Um, you know, again, it's hard for me to really say because if I don't see them again, I can't like think right. that it was okay. But sure. Um, but you know, I have. Yeah, I mean, there's. You know, these people struggle every day, right. even when they're sober for you know a year, two years, right. three years. They still struggle, but. You know, I, my, you know, my philosophy and my heart of heart is that, you know, you know, you relapse, we're going to do it again. We're right. going to do it again. So the point is, even if you've been through this, you're personally going through this, a family member is going through this, you've relapsed a number of times, you keep trying. Right. Because the past is the past. We can't change the past. We have to move forward and, you know, and, and everybody needs to get a, you know, you just got to do it again. I get patients that come in and they're just tired. They're like, you know, I've done this, Barbara. Like, this is the seventh, eighth time I've done it. Yeah. You know, and you do have to pick out some of these people have kids they want to do this for, their families. And, you know, once they start feeling better after the detox phase, you know, and I, I come up with some plans that, you know, it's baby steps, you know, yeah. and, and it's just, but. One of my close friends really has struggled with um, addiction. And one of the things that she said, too, just talking about multiple relapses, mm. it's always great to go back because the groups that she goes to, there's no judgment mm -hmm. there. So she knows, like, if she falters or she missteps, it's not like you're going to go back in and everyone's going to be riding on you or something. Right. It's just going to be like, welcome back to the group, you know, yeah. glad you're back yeah. kind of thing. But that's supports, and that's the lack of supports. There's really not a lot of... Um, hope when you don't sure. have supports and supports doesn't have to be family like I feel like I'm a support where I work like yeah. when they come back we're going to do this again we're going to fix we're going to figure it out um it that's could a, you yeah know. that's a great point because the supports out there are so different sometimes from families because families can you know with all their good intentions they're going through something too and they can kind of beat a person up a little bit mm -hmm. you know don't you love me why did you do this again can't you stop you could stop if you love me you know, and like all all these types of statements. Yeah. They can be dysfunction. Not yeah, all families are and supportive. I mean, but everybody can be a support. And like sure. I always think to myself, this is somebody's child, somebody's mother, right. somebody's father. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you really need to. 
you know, if somebody needs help, you help them, you yeah. know, I mean, and not judge. The judging is just... No, and I think getting back to that, I mean, it's, it's an addiction. So that person can't stop at this point in time. You know, it's not a, it's not coming from you don't love me or, you know, that person most likely doesn't want to wake up every morning and say, God, I'm, I'm going to go use again and I'm going to... Well, I think you have to look great. at it as a medical illness. Right. I mean, right. that's the whole key. I mean, there's a lot of you know, negative dispersions that society has cast on people who are addicted, but that doesn't really help the problem out. If anything, it makes it worse. So we have to look at this as a medical illness and we have to treat it as such. And I would say if there's anyone out there who's listening to this, who's had a, a personal success story where you've been able to beat your addiction, reach out to us. I'd love to have another show where we can have people on. Who, that would be great. Who, yeah. you know, been able to, because I think people who are addicted need to know that there are others out there who have been able to to beat this. And that would be a, a fabulous thing to talk about. You could probably uh, make an impact on, on quite a few listeners. Definitely, right. yeah. Barbara, we're going to start closing it up. Is there any message you want to leave those listeners with today? Um, I just, like I just said, I think everybody, you know, we need to support our neighbor or whoever it is, um, when they're going through a tough time, because I just, we, there's nobody out there that it, you know, this, we can't be stricken with this, um, with addiction. You just never, never know. Right. So I just feel like, you know, we have to be kind to one another and just support everyone. And I think the world would be somewhat better. I think you're right, Barbara. That's, That's a great, great way to close it off. So <laughs> I want to so really much. personally you're thank you for taking the time to do this. I think that our listeners really probably got a lot out of this. It was It's really an interesting topic, and you've brought a lot of expertise to the table. So so thank you very much for you're being welcome. part of thank uh, you. Thank you for having me. Our, our podcast. You're, you're very welcome. All right.